Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the European Central Bank, at least virtually. My name is uh, Gabriel Glöckler. I'm a principal advisor in the communications department here at the bank, and I have the privilege of being your moderator for this, uh, uh, the next hour in this uh, seminar. Of course, rising prices are on the minds of most Europeans. It's a source of, of worry and, and real economic pain. And that's why we were discussing today what's behind it, what's keeping inflation high, what we at the ECB can do about it. Uh, we're looking forward to your questions and to have really have an open dialogue about this. Uh, and, uh, and I'm sure we're going to have a very fruitful discussion uh, on, on these very important issues. Before moving to the presentations uh, by our two presenters here, which I will introduce in a minute, let me go through a few housekeeping steps. Uh, first of all, please keep your microphones muted unless you're speaking. You're also encouraged to keep on your cameras. It gives us a nice, friendly atmosphere in this seminar. Um, please be aware that this seminar is being recorded and we will be publishing it on our website in the coming days. And if you're ever experiencing technical problems, please write to the host in the chat box and a member of our team will be with you and assist you right away. Now, I'm very pleased that we are joined here today uh, by two uh, experts on precisely that topic. Uh, the first one is Oscar Arthur, who is the Director of General Economics here at the ECB. And with us is also Sarah Holton, who is the Head of Division of Prices and Costs, also in, in Director of General Economics. You're in very, very capable hands on this important topic and for any questions that you have. And with this, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gabriel. And uh, good afternoon to, to everyone. It's our pleasure to, to be here and to have this opportunity to interact with uh, members of our society, uh, civil society, uh, to reflect on, on issues that are, of course, of, of common interest for, for all of us. No? Uh, today's talk on, on inflation is... Uh, it's for us a good uh, opportunity no? to, to explain what we think about uh, the underlying uh, inflationary forces, uh, to share with all of you our diagnosis of the situation in terms of the uh, potential evolution of, of prices in the future, but also to explain a little bit uh, what are the, the decisions and the actions taken by the ECB no? to, to counter this uh, inflationary uh, bust. So as Gabriel said, uh, I'm in the very good company of my colleague Sarah Holton, who is the head of the Prices and Cost Division and, and hence one of the main experts in, in inflation-related issues at the Economics Department of the, of the ECB. So in order to, to introduce uh, uh, the topic, the question, uh, and, and hopefully later on the, the conversation, uh, we have prepared a few, a few slides that I would like to uh, share with, with all of you. So... Um, so, in terms of the of the origins of uh, of the inflationary, the current inflationary uh, episode, I mean, what is behind this uh, this inflation uh, episode? Well, I think it is fair to recognize that the, the current situation is the result of the conjunction of a sequence of various shocks. Some of them coming from the supply side, but also with a with a component of uh, demand uh, pressure. I mean, this is the this is the result of a, of a series of of exceptional uh, disturbances uh, hitting the, the the euro area economy. I mean, after the the pandemic, uh, the recovery that took place uh, after the initial phase of the pandemic, after the lockdowns, gave rise to some uh, imbalances between supply and demand in several uh, segments of the goods and services market. As a result of that, uh, we saw uh, some disruptions in, in, in uh, supply chains, in uh, international trade, giving rise to the so-called uh, bottlenecks. These bottlenecks in the provision of some goods and services uh, essentially led to uh, uh, high prices for these uh, goods and, and services. So this was an initial symptom of um, a growing underlying uh, uh, inflationary pressures. Later on, what we saw is a, is a rapid increase in energy cost, even before uh, the, the outbreak of the unjustified war of uh, Russia on, on Ukraine. We, we already saw in 2021 some significant increases in energy cost. But of course, uh, after the, the beginning of the war, uh, this, uh, this situation worsened significantly and the, and the prices of uh, most energy inputs 
went up uh, very very quickly, as uh, you all you all know. And this had direct consequences in terms of, of prices. Uh, but given that uh, energy is, is is an input for uh, the production of many other goods and services, we uh, we also saw some uh, spreading out of uh, this inflationary uh, shock in in the in the prices of uh, other many many other uh, goods and, and services. Then the the demand uh, was recovering, as I said uh, as I said before. Um, at different pace, depending on, on the different uh, segments of uh, goods and, and services. Uh, and in some cases, uh, uh, what uh, we saw and we are still seeing some of this is the release of some pent up demand uh, that was accumulated during the during the uh, lockdowns. And uh, the reopening of the of the economy gave right gave, gave rise to this uh, release of, of pent up demand. No? And still today, we see a very strong uh, demand component in the inflation uh, dynamics of some services, especially those that benefited most from the reopening of the of the economy, like uh, tourism related activities, hospitality, restaurants, and and so on. It is fair to say that it was not only the the big uh, size uh, of the shocks uh, what led uh, to a very to a very uh, uh, significant increase in in prices, but also. Uh, what we saw is a very, a very pass through, a very, uh, very fast pass through, a very quick transmission of these shocks into into final prices. I mean, the speed of the transmission of these uh, shocks into into final prices was uh, probably uh, higher and faster than what we saw in some uh, previous uh, uh, episodes of uh, 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 inflationary inflationary pressures. Right? And this this explains. This uh, this uh, high, extremely high velocity in the transmission of these shocks into the prices of goods and services and in the, in the uh, cost, customers' uh, uh, basket. So last year in 2021, as as it is illustrated in the in the chart in this uh, in this slide, uh, uh, much of the of the dynamics of uh, overall inflation uh, uh, was driven by by energy. The red uh, the red bars in this in this uh, picture. Lately, uh, starting uh, from uh, uh, the first quarter of this year, we have seen a very significant uh, a slowdown in energy inflation. And at this stage, uh, energy inflation is close to, to zero and it has been even negative at some, at some point. No? And uh, well, in the absence of new shocks, uh, we would expect uh, energy costs to remain at relatively uh, moderate, uh, moderate levels. So. Next uh, slide, please. Uh, but uh, as I said uh, before, it's not only a story based on, on a series of uh, supply shocks. Uh, what we have seen at the same time is that uh, the recovery of demand has contributed to add some further inflationary pressures as well. And uh, in some cases, this uh, strong rebound in the demand is, is the reflection of uh, the accumulation, the significant accumulation of savings during, during the pandemic you know, that uh, have sustained this uh, uh, strong demand in, in some goods and, and services and is contributing to, to uh, maintain the relatively high inflation, inflation rate. So this, this picture in this uh, slide uh, shows how, how quickly and how intensively uh, the original uh, inflationary shock has spread to the vast majority of services and goods in the in the in the consumers uh, basket. Just to recall that at the end of uh, 2021, that is less than uh, one and a half year ago, I mean more than 50 percent of the goods and services in the basket were still uh, uh, having uh, prices uh, growth. Uh, the, the growth of their prices uh, was still uh, below two percent for half of the of the items in the in the basket. No. Now at this stage, as you can see there, I mean the vast majority near uh, near ninety percent of of total items in the in the basket uh, are experimenting uh, are experiencing uh, uh, price growth that is uh, above two uh, uh, percent eh? and even four percent. So the vast majority of of the items in the basket uh, uh, are growing at, at significantly uh, higher higher rates. So next uh, slide, please. So we pay a lot of uh, attention uh, at the ECB uh, to the different metrics of uh, what we call uh, underlying inflation, no? um, which uh, typically captures the most uh, stable and uh, uh, persistent component of uh, inflation uh, dynamics. No? I mean, these are typically those goods and, and services uh, whose prices move more slowly. No? 
contrary to what happens with the most volatile uh, elements in the in the basket like uh, food and uh, and energy you know that we know move very very quickly you know so for us it's very important to to look at uh, the evolution of prices of uh, of these other goods and services because uh, they provide a, a very useful signal about the potential future inflation uh, dynamics you know? and what we what we are seeing uh, by examining a, a relatively large battery of uh, underlying inflation uh, indicators is that uh, first um, all these metrics uh, that uh, I mean focus on different aspects of this uh, underlying inflation dynamic uh, process all these indicators are telling us that uh, underlying inflationary pressures are still at very high levels yeah? even though we are seeing some of these indicators easing yeah? some of them are uh, seem to to be leveling off and uh, some of them even have a uh, have dropped in the last uh, few months, but still the level of underlying inflationary pressures, according to basically all of these uh, uh, indicators, is still at historical, uh, historically uh, high high levels. So, and this is, of course, uh, an element of concern because this means that uh, inflation, which has been too high for too long, is probably going to remain above our medium term target of two percent for 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 some time still. Okay. Next uh, slide, please. So, uh, in parallel to, to these, uh, let's say, more exogenous shocks or perturbances related to energy, related to food more, more recently, uh, and uh, demand factors, uh, what we have seen from the side of uh, uh, income sources is that both uh, wages and uh, unit profits have contributed to the to the acceleration of of inflation. Okay? In particular, unit profits uh, have uh, contributed significantly to the acceleration of inflation in the last uh, few few quarters. This has probably been been possible because uh, demand in some sectors has been very strong relative to uh, supply uh, capacity uh, that in some cases has been reduced, constrained by uh, this sort of uh, bottlenecks that I referred to uh, before. In some other cases, uh, we know that uh, whenever uh, inflation is, is very high for everybody, it's relatively easier for uh, firms to pass through uh, the increase in the cost without facing significant uh, 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 decreases in their, in their market uh, shares. And certainly the shock to inflation to, to uh, energy prices has facilitated this rapid repricing by, by, by firms no? that in some cases may have allowed them even to not only to maintain their profit margins, but also in some sectors, in some particular parts of the economy, even to increase their, their, their profit margins. Eh? So uh, this, this, uh, this component, uh, unit profits, as I said, uh, have contributed, has contributed uh, significantly in the last few quarters to, to the acceleration of domestic uh, prices. Now, looking forward, we expect uh, some moderation, no? precisely because some of these factors uh, that have pushed up unit profits, like these imbalances between supply and demand in some sectors, uh, the, the, the high cost of energy, are temporary factors. No? Indeed, uh, uh, energy costs, as I said before, have, normal, have normalized uh, significantly. No? But still, for the time being, this is an important driver of uh, domestic prices uh, inflation. And the other uh, important element, uh, next uh, slide, please. Uh, of course, is uh, is uh, uh, wage growth. I mean, for for many years, wages uh, grew at very modest rates in the in the euro area. For the last decade, uh, before the COVID rate, we know that uh, wages were relatively flat, relatively subdued. They wouldn't react much to uh, shocks to the to the economy. But this situation changed uh, after the the COVID, uh, after the the pandemic, and for the last uh, year, year and a half, we have seen some a strong acceleration in wage in wage growth and, and indeed uh, uh, we are still in a period in which uh, wages keep uh, keep accelerating you know? and this of course uh, uh, is is one of the elements that uh, is contributing and will contribute for some time to uh, strengthen this underlying inflation uh, dynamics next uh, slide please so, uh, looking forward, how does the outlook for inflation uh, looks uh, looks like? Well, we at the ACB, and I guess this is true for uh, many other analysts and, and uh, institutions, we pay a substantial amount of uh, attention to indicators about uh, future inflation expectations. Mm -hmm. this, these are uh, good references for us in order to learn what economic agents are thinking about the future evolution of uh, uh, inflation. 
and we look at a, at a wide uh, uh, set of uh, inflation expectations uh, indicators, some of them coming from the consumers, some of them coming from the firms, some of them coming from uh, market uh, participants. Uh, we also run some specific uh, surveys to learn how uh, people think about the future evolution of uh, 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 prices and, and inflation. And uh, the signal that we get from this uh, wide uh, battery of, of indicators of future inflation expectations is pretty clear. I mean, uh, most agents, all agents, I mean, all groups of, 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 of agents are uh, essentially telling us that uh, they expect some significant reduction in inflation rates so that uh, uh, most indicators of inflation expectations in two, three years' time uh, are very close to our medium term inflation target of, of, of 2%. But it is true that this disinflationary process will, will take uh, will take some time. Okay? But it is remarkable that uh, in spite of the very, very uh, significant shocks that we have received over the last uh, couple of years with very high uh, inflation rates, at some point even above 10%, medium-term inflation expectations uh, held by uh, most agents are uh, relatively well anchored. Uh, around this medium term reference of uh, two percent. Next uh, slide, please. So uh, this this uh, this picture in this uh, in this slide uh, summarizes, I think, in a in a very in a very clear way what uh, what has been the the recent uh, narrative about inflation in the in the euro area, and also contains some I hope useful information about how we see uh, uh, inflation evolving in the in the coming years. No? The story of inflation in 20 in 22 as I said at the beginning of the of the presentation is very much a story based of the huge energy uh, cost uh, uh, shock. Yeah? I mean half of uh, of uh, inflation uh, of the inflation rate in 22 can be attributed to this uh, rapid increase in, in energy inflation the green bar in this uh, in this picture. Now in 23 I mean uh, Unless there are new shocks, which uh, in principle uh, we are not uh, uh, discounting significant cost on the significant shock, sorry, on the on the energy front. I mean, but of course the situation is not fully normalized. But in principle, the scenario for for energy supply is, is better than in twenty two. Energy energy inflation should uh, should uh, be very very small this year. Okay? However, as you can see there, food inflation is, is still uh, uh, contributing very significantly to, to total inflation. And this is going to be the case for the coming months as well. And now this year as well, what we are seeing is that uh, what we call there HICP excluding energy and food, which is uh, our uh, most popular metric of core inflation, one of the key components of underlying inflation, is accelerating, is gaining, gaining traction. Uh, and this captures the, the prices of uh, non-energy industrial goods and services mainly. So uh, for some time, we will see still relatively high inflation rates for uh, goods and for services. Uh, to some extent, uh, reflecting the accumulated uh, um, uh, inflation uh, uh, pressures uh, in the pipeline of the production processes of, of these uh, uh, goods and, and services. So it will uh, still take some time for this accumulated pipeline pressures to be fully transmitted into the into the final prices of uh, goods and services and this will explain that core inflation which is uh, being uh, uh, which is receiving a lot of attention in the media and in the uh, reports of the analyst will be uh, still relatively high for some for some uh, for some time no? later on in 24 and 25 we should uh, see according to our uh, forecast we should see some further normalization in all components of of, of inflation and in particular, we should uh, observe some moderation of, of core inflation. No? This, again, in the absence of new shocks uh, uh, to any of the uh, consumer basket uh, components, this should allow uh, the inflation, the inflation, the headline inflation rate to get back to levels very close to our 2% uh, medium term reference by the end of 2025. Next uh, slide, let me just uh, finish with a mention on uh, what the ECB is doing no? and has been doing over the last uh, uh, one year and a half to tame this uh, inflationary uh, episode. No? I mean, we, we started to uh, change our uh, view on the, on the uh, appropriate monetary policy stance at the end of uh, 2021. 
when the when the governing council of the ECB already communicated its intention to discontinue the the pandemic uh, program uh, for uh, asset purchases and uh, since then uh, there has been a very very significant increase and as, as you all know in in our main uh, interest rate uh, uh, policy interest rates uh, uh, references uh, actually, since the first uh, interest rate hike that took place in, in last uh, July until now, interest rates have gone up by uh, 375 uh, basis points, which is a very significant and a very quick uh, tightening uh, uh, cycle. In this picture, you see how different uh, references for short-term and long-term interest rates have changed since uh, December 21 until now no? and you can see that uh, there has been a very very significant increase in these uh, interest rate uh, references at the same time uh, the ecb has uh, made important decisions uh, pertaining the management of its uh, asset purchase programs i mean initially uh, we stopped the net purchases of, of assets and in the in the last uh, governing council meeting that took place a few weeks ago uh, the governing council decided to stop reinvesting uh, the maturing securities of its main asset purchase program, the, the so-called uh, APP. So um, all these all these uh, decisions are the reflection of the strong determination of the ECB to uh, deliver on its mandate to, and to uh, facilitate the convergence of inflation to two percent uh, in a timely in a timely manner. So my my last uh, slide is just to to illustrate. Uh, can you move uh, forward? Thank you. It's just to illustrate that uh, uh, monetary policy is, uh, is uh, transmitting quite uh, quite uh, uh, swiftly and smoothly and, and strongly to the uh, to the main uh, prices in the in the financial in the financial sector. What we are seeing is that uh, the interest rates of uh, loans, be it for firms or for households, are adjusting uh, uh, in accordance to the to the rise in our uh, policy interest rates. And this is already having some contractionary impact in terms of the uh, evolution of, of credit, no? which is a, a necessary uh, ingredient to moderate demand as a prerequisite to uh, moderate inflation and to finally arrive to the, to the point at which uh, we all want to arrive in a timely manner, which is one in which prices growth at a, a significantly lower pace than the, than the current one in line with our medium term uh, target of, of 2%. So let me let me stop here and uh, happy to take some questions and thank you Oscar thank you for uh, for this very interesting and and, and uh, comprehensive uh, presentation we now go into a conversation and a discussion with questions with answers uh, hearing your views um now I know, I know it's been a lot of information to digest um, but uh, let's get going um, if you would like to ask a question uh, and then please raise your electronic hand until I call you, and then unmute yourself, uh, uh, and that we can that you can ask your question, and then we try to to answer them. If at the end of this uh, uh, session we don't have time for all of your questions, please do write them in the chat, and we would all follow up uh, later on. Um, but maybe uh, we start first with uh, we have a first uh, uh, question here, Dara Turnbull of Housing Europe. Um, please, Dara. What would you like to uh, put to our panelists? Thanks. Ah, yes. Thank you for the presentation. I have two questions. Uh, the first one is that we see, and as you mentioned, unit prices or unit profits have increased um, due to scarcity primarily in the market. What I'm wondering is that, is there now a risk that given that producers have seen that those profits are tolerable to consumers, that those um, prices, those higher prices become embedded within markets even as supply chain issues and other issues that are causing scarcity decline. The second question I have is related to the impact of housing costs. Of course, in HICP, we don't measure the owner occupier cost of housing. That's a separate piece of work produced by Eurostat, for example. But I'm wondering to what extent um, issues like higher interest rates, particularly for mortgage holders, are being considered uh, by the ECB in terms of their uh, outlook for where interest rates need to go and um, yeah kind of how housing costs outside of HICP are kind of factored into your equation. Thanks a lot. Uh, Oscar? How are you? Well thank you thank you very much Dara, for this uh, very very interesting uh, question. So 
on profit uh, on profit margins, no? or unit profits, no? which is our most preferred measure to to think about this this issue. I mean, in principle, we maintain the view that uh, in spite of this uh, strong rebound in unit profits that we have seen over the last few quarters, we expect some moderation of unit profits as as we uh, go further into our uh, projection uh, horizon. Why? Well, essentially because the the main factors that have pushed unit profits up, we think, are uh, of temporary nature. No? Let me let me mention again the the two or three main factors that are uh, allowing firms to or many firms, not all of them, but many firms to maintain relatively strong uh, unit profits. Well, in some cases, this this was due to uh, bottlenecks, no, that restricted uh, the the supply of some of some goods at a time at which the demand for those uh, uh, goods was uh, was uh, quite strong. No? This was the case in many with many industrial goods. No? Now we know that bottlenecks are recent, that uh, uh, transportation and uh, logistic chains are normalizing uh, uh, quite fast, I would say, in the last uh, few quarters. No? So this, this uh, artificial uh, reduction in, in supply is probably uh, losing some, some relevance. And this, this factor should probably be less important when thinking about the future uh, evolution of, of profits. No? Other important factor was the... Uh, uh, the situation in which uh, energy prices uh, went went up uh, very very quickly, so uh, this we think could have facilitated that many competitors uh, would raise their prices because I mean it was relatively easy to justify in front of uh, their customers that they uh, raised uh, their prices because you know energy was very high and so on. No? I mean this situation is now uh, has changed also. Uh, quite significantly. Now, we are not in a normal situation, of course, in terms of uh, the energy context, but the energy context has improved significantly with respect to what we had uh, just before the, the last uh, winter. No? So now I guess it's going to be more difficult to go for this kind of uh, across-the-board increases in, in prices based on the justification of very high uh, energy cost. And the third element, which is perhaps going to have some some more persistence, no, uh, has to do with the very strong rebound in the demand for uh, some services. Those services that I mentioned before that are benefiting more from the reopening of the economy, traveling, uh, tourism-related activities, and so on. I mean, we know that the demand is being very, very strong. Probably there is a very uh, important uh, component of pent-up demand there. And this is... I mean, this is uh, drawing uh, a context in which uh, uh, for firms is quite, let's say, easy to 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 set uh, relatively high uh, profit uh, profit uh, unit profits, no? Because demand is is very strong and, and supply, at least in the short term, is relatively constrained. No? This element is is still uh, pushing up uh, prices, I think. Um, but in our uh, in our forecast, uh, we expect uh, unit profits to uh, moderate uh, as long as these uh, three factors uh, lose some 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 momentum. No? On the housing related uh, issues, as you rightly mentioned, uh, uh, I mean in the HICP produced by Eurostat, uh, there is not an explicit uh, um, uh, component capturing the owner occupied housing uh, cost. So this is not in our uh, 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 reference uh, for uh, for uh, for inflation. Uh, so um, and the main reason uh, why uh, uh, I mean we don't we don't take into account in 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 our uh, reference the evolution of housing prices essentially because housing prices has an important component of an asset, uh, which is likely to be uh, sensitive with respect to changes in the interest rates, of course. But uh, being it uh, an asset is not uh, something that goes uh, straight into into our uh, uh, price uh, price reference. No, I mean the housing the housing market is is an important channel of transmission of monetary policy. We know that, no, because I mean typically it's very it's very uh, 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 sensitive with respect to changes in, in in financing conditions, and this is why we are uh, monitoring especially this. Uh, this uh, this market, no, this part of the of the economy, no, because it's, it's a good uh, leading indicator of uh, how our monetary policy is transmitting to the to the rest of the of the economy. No, this is, uh, I think, uh, what I can tell you about that uh, that particular issue. 
Okay, thank you, Oscar. Um, that leads us to our second question. Uh, that is Anna of Burke, uh, uh, the European Consumer Organization. Anna, over thank to you. you yeah, thank you very much. Um, and very interesting presentation. I had a question actually um, on the banking sector specifically, um, because you well explained that inflation passed very quickly onto consumers, including in mortgage credits and so on. But what we observe is that um, the profitability of banks is not passed on to consumers in terms of higher interest rates on saving accounts or um, lower charges for payment accounts, these kind of things. So I'm wondering, is that something you are observing, assessing? Uh, do you have data on this? And is there something uh, where you see uh, European Union can, could take action um, to, to mitigate this um, unfortunate situation for consumers? Well, that's a good uh, that's a good question, Anna. Thanks, thanks a lot uh, for for it. Uh, of course, uh, uh, we monitor very very closely, you know, the the transmission of our monetary policy through the banking sector, especially because the banking sector in the euro area economy, as you know very well, is 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 a, a first order uh, channel for the transmission of our of our monetary policy. You know, is 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 probably the most important uh, transmission uh, channel, or, or one of the most important ones. No? I mean, what we have seen is that uh, initially the, the increase in the interest rate transmitted very, very swiftly, very, very smoothly to the loans rates uh, of, of uh, to the to the interest rates paid by, by borrowers. Uh, they also transmitted very, very quickly to the interest rates that banks have to pay themselves to, 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 to get some some financing from the from the capital markets. But you are right. Initially, we didn't see a, a proportional increase in the cost of of deposits. No, this is changing. I would say. No, I mean, according to the latest data, we are seeing some positive reaction in the interest rate uh, paid by by banks on, on on deposits. Of course, with with some important differences. No, oversight uh, deposits uh, still pay very very low remunerations, but time deposits are are. Uh, uh, um, We've seen some some more significant increases in in their uh, interest rates, and we are seeing a, a very natural composition effect with more customers moving their money from uh, overnight deposits into uh, time time deposits time deposits. You know, so the average uh, interest rate paid on deposits is is going is going uh, is going up. No, maybe not uh, as quick and not as much as as many bank uh, customers would would wish. That, that I would agree with uh, with you. But it's not something that uh, the ECB can can control uh, uh, directly. You know? this is uh, at the end. Uh, this is uh, something that uh, uh, is is controlled by by the banks. That is subject to the competition of the uh, within the banking uh, sector. And uh, in principle, I mean, it corresponds to the to the banks to to set uh, uh, the, the the deposit uh, uh, the rates on on, on their deposits. You no, know? it's not something that we can. Control directly, no. That is, uh, uh, is 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 a target variable for us. It's an important one because it's it's part of the transmission of our monetary policy, but it's not something that uh, the ECB can control uh, directly. No, nor we have uh, a specific uh, competencies uh, on that uh, on that uh, uh, particular uh, matter. No, I would say that uh, liquidity conditions are still very 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 favorable, so that uh, there is uh, still a lot of liquidity in the system. Uh, but uh, I mean, the, the, in principle, uh, we, we would expect some some fall in this uh, liquidity, in part as the uh, ECB reduces the size of its balance sheet and absorbs some of the liquidity in the system. And as this happens, my intuition, my my, my hinge is that uh, we would probably see some some rise, uh, some additional uh, increase in the interest rates paid on on deposits. So, but this is not something that we can control uh, directly. Thank okay, you. thanks a lot. Thanks, Oscar. And the next question is uh, from uh, Kuba Gogolevsky of Greenpeace. Kuba, over to you. We don't, we don't hear you. Do you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, Given that uh, last year there has been a decrease of uh, oil, gas, and electricity use in Europe, and you've seen that you've shown that the energy was an uh, interesting, uh, important component of inflation, do you have data how much the decrease in demand 
has been contributing negatively to inflation. And the same, we have now a target on the EU level also for the decrease, 15% of decrease of gas demand use, right? Which translate to 60 BCM. Do you have indication or data how much the reduction on demand correlates or translates into decreased inflation forecast for 2023? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kuba. Uh, uh, I'm not aware of any uh, specific uh, estimation of the impact of the fall in the, in the demand for the different uh, energy inputs on, the, on their prices. In some cases, because the prices of these uh, energy inputs are set at the, at the level of the global international markets. No? So they do not only depend on the evolution of demand by, by European uh, consumers. No? But uh, what it is true is that uh, we have seen a significant drop in the demand, uh, for instance, uh, for uh, for gas uh, by by uh, uh, EU uh, uh, consumers. No? As far as I remember, according to some estimates by the European Commission, uh, we have seen a 20% drop in the total consumption of gas uh, with respect to the to the previous year, no? which I think is is a remarkable, uh, important uh, effort by by all uh, EU uh, consumers no? that certainly goes in the in the in the right direction no? uh, as a consequence of, of a combination of, of some policies that were there to to facilitate or to incentivize the, the reduction in consumption but also we cannot forget that this uh, significant reduction in gas consumption has been probably possible also because of good luck because we had uh, this uh, relatively mild uh, mild winter no? for sure all this has facilitated some further reduction in the in the in the uh, in the prices of of gas, I mean, to which extent uh, this is driven by the demand of uh, European uh, consumers? Uh, that I cannot answer directly, you know, because I mean, it's, it's a quite a globalized uh, market, uh, and you know, the supply comes from not only from uh, I mean, comes fortunately not only from from Russia, but from an increasing number of suppliers, you no. Know? But certainly the, the contention of the, of the demand, the restraint of the, of the demand, uh, which I think is, is good news overall, has for sure contributed to, to moderate uh, the cost there. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is from Lukas Krebel of the New Economics Foundation. Lukas, over to you. Hi, uh, thanks very much for this presentation. So I have two related questions, I think, about the supply side character of this crisis and the ECB response. Uh, so first uh, is, uh, so given, you know, the, the inflation episode, as you showed, it was mainly driven by the shock in energy prices, mainly gas gas prices, and now they transmitted to the wider economy. Uh, so now we reach the point that, you know, there's some base effects start to come into play, like, you know, once we are more than a year since the, the price shock happened, you know, the, 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 the base uh, price level that we calculate based on will by itself, you know, lead to reduction in the rate. And then the second thing, like, as you also mentioned, the energy prices and the gas prices have been coming significant, significantly down. So we'd expect the inflation rate to start reduced by that. Um, so to what extent you see it's simply, you know, the matter of, uh, of those two things materializing, like the base effects and the energy input prices falling significantly down, uh, having impact on inflation rate going eventually down. And to what extent do you think that the ECB response the, of higher interest rates um, has, has driving this fall in inflation when it's so much to do, driven by supply side? And so mentioned oh, there was very quick like first order impacts so on like the loan uh, interest rates and so on. But as we know, we know this is famous sake of uh, long and variable lags about how long the policy takes to transmit to real economy. So we're very interested to hear your thoughts about to what extent you see this tightening uh, plays major role in that crisis. And a quick related one to that. Uh, so since, you know, uh, energy input was such a driver of this crisis, so we had obviously uh, energy supply issue, while um, also uh, uh, the EU has planned to move towards cleaner energy systems. So does the ECB consider that, you know, uh, the policy response should try to address the supply side in some way rather than focus on demand such as you know inflation was not really driven by demand not to start with at least and you know and then if uh, interest rate hikes uh, constrain you know finance or load rates to fix like energy efficiency or, or clean energy so how, how we could actually reduce demand for this very volatile input of fossil energy would you not consider like the better policy response would be uh, of 
dual interest rate policy when we want to maintain cheap interest rates uh, for, for the things that will help to reduce our, our demand of this very volatile input that has driven inflation. Thank you. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lucas. Uh, interesting, but, uh, but tricky, tricky issues. No? The first one, uh, I think you are absolutely right. No, I mean, uh, what we have seen in terms of the moderation of uh, energy prices has not much to do with the, the response of the ECB's monetary policy. I mean, this uh, this uh, reduction in, in energy uh, cost uh, have to do more with the normalization of supply, with the substitution of uh, uh, deliveries from 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 Russia, uh, uh, from Russian gas, uh, from uh, other providers, uh, and so on. No, I mean, it's, it's not uh, it's not monetary it's not monetary policy for sure. No, uh, we know that uh, the capacity of monetary policy to uh, counteract uh, supply shocks is is very is very limited. No, I mean, especially in the short run, there is very little to to be done on on that. No, but still, I think the key question here is. Uh, and it's a fair question, no? So why, if this is uh, originally uh, a supply shock, uh, why is the ECB tightening? No, it's it's monetary policy. No, this is my my reading of your underlying uh, question. No, in a sense. No? Well, I, I guess there are two, three reasons here. No, first of all, as I said before, I mean, even though the most visible shocks triggered in this uh, inflationary episode are located on the supply side, energy bottlenecks, and so on, I mean. As I said before, I mean, uh, it is undeniable that there is an important, um, uh, significant uh, demand component there. Okay? So it's not only a story of, of supply. Uh, demand has been quite uh, quite strong, okay? especially after the reopening of the, of the economy. And uh, monetary policy can't and should act uh, through demand. Okay? So uh, it's not only supply, it's demand, and this, in a sense, justifies no? uh, the kind of uh, restrictive uh, policy that we are implementing. No? But also, uh, do, do, uh, even if the origin of the shock is located on the supply side, I mean, we know we have to avoid at all cost a scenario in which inflation expectations become the anchor. And they may become the anchor just because of a, a, an initial supply shock. But it is our job to keep these uh, inflation expectations uh, well well anchored, because we know that the alternative would be much more detrimental in terms of uh, growth, employment, and social welfare. So this again justifies uh, a swift uh, reaction by the by the central bank you know, in order to keep uh, uh, inflation expectations uh, well 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 anchored. No? So even though uh, we cannot do much in the short term to uh, uh, moderate. The inflationary impact of uh, energy shocks or other supply side shocks. I think that in the current circumstances, it is very much well justified uh, and a strong reaction by the by the central bank. You know? first of all, to moderate the inflationary pressure coming from the from the uh, demand side, and second, to keep inflation expectations uh, well anchored around our two percent uh, uh, target. On the second issue, uh, Lucas, if I if I got it uh, correctly. In a sense, you are uh, questioning uh, whether it would be uh, preferable to keep interest rates low to facilitate, let's say, uh, policies headed towards uh, the green transition, no? the energy transition. Is that right? Was that the question? Yeah, so to clarify, yes, uh, and given, you know, the ECB's primary mandate, so given, you know, how energy shocks, and I mean, it's not the first oil and gas shock that, you know, the Western world experienced, this energy will always be volatile. So considering that, shouldn't the ECB uh, consider policy that maintains interest rates low for transition, not just for the climate goals, but yeah. also to reduce our reliance on volatile fossil energy and, you know, help price stability in that way? Well, our, our, I mean, there is a very strong logic no, in your, uh, in your uh, uh, conjecture, no? but uh, let me just re-emphasize that uh, the ECB has, has a very clear mandate for good reasons, no? which, is a, which is a mandate on, on price stability. Yeah? And uh, in order to deliver on that mandate, and it, this mandate is, of course, well-grounded, as I said just a couple of minutes ago, on the uh, idea that preserving price stability is the best service that a central bank can do in terms of providing the best possible conditions for sustainable growth, employment creation, and social welfare. No? So our mandate is to keep uh, price uh, uh, stability. No? Uh, 
um, it is for for uh, for other actors to to probably uh, lead this transition towards uh, 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 greener uh, um, energy energy mix. We know that the ECB is very much uh, supportive of this uh, 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 green transition, and without prejudice of our uh, main mandate on price stability, the institution is supporting wherever it can, and again, conditional on uh, not uh, running against its uh, primary mandate on price stability, is, is favoring uh, this, uh, this, uh, this green transition. No? But it is for other actors uh, to lead with the appropriate tools that we lack here at the at the at the central bank to promote uh, this uh, this transition, no? and I think that uh, in this respect uh, uh, it is for other actors no, that are much better equipped than we are to steer uh, this uh, this transition, no? and uh, interest rates are only part of the of the equation. No? I think there are uh, other more important tools to to facilitate this uh, this transition no? that we all we all wish to take uh, to take uh, place in a timely manner. Thanks a lot, uh, Oscar. Um, so far, we don't have any further raised hands. Um, if there are any, oh, there's Jordi. Jordi has, has uh, raised his hand. Uh, Jordi, can you yeah get on the screen? Great. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? On positive money, yes, I understand. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, you, you have said multiple times today that you see uh, demand also being a, an important player and that you see demand being too high. And I listened to a speech by Philip Blaine not that long ago, and he has a nice slide where she shows that private consumption and total investment are right now just slightly above uh, 2019 levels in real terms. So on what indicators are you basing your claim that demand is high or a driver of inflation? And I would be interested in your answer. Thank you very much. Well, that's a good, uh, that's a fair point, uh, uh, Jordi. I mean, uh, when assessing the, the the inflationary component coming from from demand, we have also to take into account what is the position of the, let's say, of the of the supply schedule. You no, know? what are the supply conditions? No. And you are right. I mean, if you look at the absolute levels of consumption and investment, one would conclude that uh, we are not uh, uh, above, significantly above the pre-COVID uh, levels. No? But we have to take into account that uh, for most part of the recovery uh, period, of the recent recovery period, and uh, for most part of the inflationary episode, supply conditions have have been quite uh, uh, constrained. No? When, when thinking about uh, uh, bottlenecks in the industry, we're thinking about uh, some services are still being constrained by uh, pandemic-related measures and so on. This means that the supply side was not working at full uh, at full capacity. No? So this means that even if demand was not above the level uh, prevailing before the pandemic, the inflationary pressure was relatively high because supply in some of these sectors was not uh, sufficiently elastic no? due to this combination of supply bottlenecks, uh, high prices of energy, uh, uh, other commodities, and uh, and so on. No? So, uh, and this is undeniable when you think about uh, some specific sectors, no? as, as, as the sectors as I, I mentioned before. No? Those sectors are benefiting now from the reopening of the economy related to services uh, uh, close to tourism and so on. I mean, I think it is undeniable that there is a very, very strong uh, demand component there. No? Which is driving prices uh, up. No, I mean it's always the question of identifying with precision which part of inflation is supply and which part of inflation is demand is always a very tricky one. No, I mean our experts have uh, tried to decompose the different components, and the diagnosis is clear. Is clear. I mean at the beginning of the episode it was mainly supply, but as 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 the uh, uh, economy reopened. Uh, uh, demand uh, factors played uh, played a very a very significant role. No? I mean, another aspect in which uh, you can see that uh, supply is relatively limited, given the ongoing uh, uh, demand dynamics, is is the labor market. I mean, uh, we we have plenty of information coming from from corporates telling us that they are facing uh, significant labor shortages in many sectors of the of the euro area economy. So. Uh, the, the, the slack of the economy 
the unused uh, capacity of the supply side is probably uh, very limited uh, given the ongoing the, uh, demand uh, demand conditions. Huh? Okay, thank you very much. Um, Oscar, are there any further raised hands? I don't see any at this moment in time. Maybe Sarah wants to. Sarah, maybe uh, yeah. Okay. So some yeah. final, some final comments before we wrap up. Yeah, sure. Sarah, yes, please. Yeah, no, thanks a lot. Um, it was really useful, I think, for us to hear your questions and just to say that a lot of the issues that you raised about the banking sector, about the housing market, about demand, about supply, are things that we really look at on a daily basis here. So, I mean, I think for us in projecting forward for the economy, what's really key is looking at how our monetary policy measures are going to work on all of those aspects. No? So the last um, point that we had there on demand, I think, is, is a crucial one. So while, of course, monetary policy works with long and variable lags, we do see over our projection horizon that it will dampen demand and bring prices back down to our, our, our target. Now, of course, the Governing Council meets every six weeks for good reason, that we have to respond to new information coming in and we, we take account of all of these factors into our models, into our judgment around those models, and we're constantly changing, adjusting, addressing all of these issues. So, I mean, for, for me, I think just to, as a wrap up, um, you know, we've listened also very carefully to your the points that you've raised here around all of these issues. Um, I would invite you all to, you know, keep an eye on our website for, for communications on this. I mean, our, our um, colleagues in the ECB are working very hard on all of these issues, um, how, say, for instance, climate change is impacting inflation, how bank lending conditions are going to affect households and firms. Uh, and we try to communicate on this as much as possible. So from, from my side, I'd just like to thank you all for, for the dialogue. It's been very useful for us. And um, we're always happy also bilaterally to to communicate on any of these aspects in the future. Thanks, Sarah. Oscar? No, that's fine. I mean, just to, to uh, re-emphasize uh, what uh, Sarah just said, I mean, for us, it was uh, it's very useful to have these uh, dialogues and to uh, have these uh, exchanges with, uh, with our uh, uh, fellow citizens. And uh, thank you very much eh, for the for the attention and uh, in particular for the for the very high quality of the of the questions no, that uh, uh, went uh, really to the to the core of our uh, main concerns these days. So thanks a lot. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Oscar. Thank you very much, Sarah. Before you leave, before you leave, can I ask you uh, to answer a couple of questions in uh, uh, in a feedback survey? which should be appearing on your on your screen. Uh, uh, that survey will help us to to you know make these kind of exchanges uh, better. It's completely anonymous, of course, but it helps us a lot uh, to to uh, to develop this further. And while you fill in the survey, I would like to thank Sarah and Oscar very much for the time they spent us and thank you also to you as mentioned before for your very valuable uh, contribution and question thank you very much indeed